Hi, I'm Sean Kintayashi with Sock and Valley Cute and Cuddly Schnauzers, and this little girl is Honey Bee. Today, we were supposed to do a live event, and we've been really excited about our live event. But I have to laugh, technology being what it is, we weren't able to figure out what we were doing wrong that was causing it to not go live. So, since we put so much prep work into this, we're doing it as a video. I also want to introduce you to Sienna, Sienna, there's Sienna, Sierra, and Sandy and Kim. Sandy and Kim are not only members of the SVCC Toy Schnauzers team, but they are also very good friends of mine, and we co-own dogs together. They're both uh, guardian dog um, owners, and so we'll talk a little, a little bit more about that in a bit here, but I want to point out Honey Bee has these two puppies, Sienna and Sierra, and we would call all of these recessive red. So you see that they're different colors. And so white puppies all the way to dark red puppies are referred to as recessive red. So Sandy and Kim, thank you so much for being here with me today to help me with the live event that is now a video. I make this fun anyway, right? Okay, so next up, I want to introduce you to Burberry and Mocha. Burberry and Mocha are liver colored, or some people would call it chocolate colored. Now, diehard breeders in the Schnauzer world are going to call it liver. And many of you refer to it as chocolate. I happen to like it as chocolate too. So this right here is our little chocolate boy, Mocha. He is a solid colored, and can we get um, our little Burberry here in the picture too? So he is solid colored liver or chocolate, and Burberry would be called a chocolate or liver and red. Do you see how her beard and her um, trimmings are red? Sometimes they're tan, so you could get a liver and tan colored schnauzer, or in this case, a liver and red. So this is that example of what puppies look like when they are this color. And next up, what I wanna show you are some of our doggies that are black based. So um, the recessive reds are the lightest colors and they don't have any dark colored hair anywhere on their body. But our black dogs, this is Dazzle. And we have great news. Dazzle has just come in season. So we will be breeding her in a week or so. And you can see what a solid colored black schnauzer looks like. She is very shiny and she is just beautiful. Now, next up, Kim and Sandy are, well, okay. <laughs> Sorry. They're gonna sand, hand it to me. All right, this little girl is Sparkle. And Sparkle would be called Black and Silver. And we see here Sparkle's brother, this is Larry. His new family has named him Larry and he will be going to live in New York City. And he is a black and silver, but he might also be referred to as a phantom. So this very bright pop of white is what makes the difference between a black and silver phantom versus just a black and silver. So notice in her beard, for example, she does have a little bit of white here, but it doesn't show up much as pop of color when you look at her. So some Schnauzer breeders might call her a smutty colored, um, smudge colored black and silver, whereas he would typically be called that phantom colored uh, black and silver. So again, you're gonna have a whole black body with just the silver markings. Now we have one more here that I wanna show you that also is a black based dog. And this is a party. So her name has been Oreo, but she's going to a new guardian home. And in her new home, she's going to be called Poppy. I'll tell you more about that in just a little bit. 
but when you are looking at a party colored dog, you see that they have a base that's white and then it's as if uh, color has been painted on to them. And so in this case, she's a black party, so we have black coloring. If she were a red party or a Wheaton party, she'd be creamy or red. If she were a liver party, this would be a chocolate color here. So, wanted to just introduce you to me and my dogs and some of my team here as we kick off this session today. First, big huge thank you to all of you who have been participating in my YouTube channel. I am so grateful to you. Yesterday, we reached 5,000 subscribers. Wow, that is a really big deal and I am so grateful to all of you who have shared my channel with others who have invited family and friends and people in your community to watch these videos as a way to share our beloved family pets. I also want to uh, thank you for uh, the comments and the likes and subscribing, just all of it. Big, huge, heartfelt thank you from me. And this happens to be our 500 hundred and fiftieth video. Yeah, we were planning for it to be a big live celebration. Woohoo! But hey, we're doing the next best thing. So again, thank you for being here and tuning in. So some of you were kind enough to send in questions in advance of this live session today. And we have captured your questions in preparation to answer them this afternoon. Let's see, we'll start off with Julie. Julie asked a question. Now, I happen to know that Julie has been a long time subscriber, follower. She often shows up in the comments, always grateful to see Julie. And so Julie says, hey, Mocha is going to be a therapy dog. Are you going to keep him or is he available? So fact is, I typically don't keep males here at my house because I have breeding females here at my house. And so he will go through my therapy dog training experience and then he will go into a home environment where he can be used as a therapy dog if they would like to do so. Now, she goes on to ask, what does someone need to know when they have a therapy dog who has passed all of their tests? It's going to depend on which therapy dog company, which certifying body you use. I tend to use one of two or three different ones and I make reference to them on my website, svcctoys.com, but Therapy Dog International, Alliance for Therapy Dogs, again, there's several of them. What you may want to do in your neighborhood if you're interested in having a therapy dog do that type of therapy dog work, like going to the tail wagging readers program or going into hospitals or one of the things I love to do with mine is take them into schools and teach people about why dog training is so important. And um, also to like Lehigh University, uh, when the students are studying for midterms and exams and they just need a puppy break, we love to bring our puppies and uh, create that sense of play and give students a, a break. So we've also done that sometimes in corporate meetings where our puppies will show up and be the entertainment during a, a break in a meeting. And that's always a lot of fun. So she goes on to ask, uh, do we need to start a business uh, if we want to have the dog go into the community as a therapy dog? And the answer is no, you don't. Once you are a part of a therapy dog organization and your dog has been certified, uh, their overarching insurance will cover you and your dog. Now, I will tell you that I, with SVCC uh, Toys LLC, I do have insurance to cover uh, me, my dogs, my team, all, all of that. Um, so I, I do have that as my, my dog business, but if you just had an individual therapy dog that you were taking into places, the organization that is certifying you would cover those things. And then she goes on to ask, um, or are therapy dogs, when you use that phrase, I think is what she means, um, just extra loving and support for their family? Again, it can be either one. If somebody, if a family says, hey, we have a lot going on in our family and we would love to have uh, grandmom or grandpa who's living with us have a dog here all the time because we're not 
home all the time. We're sort of coming and going, and we want that extra uh, sense of support and security here in our house for the kids, the family, the whomever. Yes, that can work uh, equally as well. Let's see. Next question that we got in advance here was from in our rice so i think it's i don't know maybe it's nancy rice or something but in rice 34102 and this person says mocha is so handsome i enjoy watching all of your dogs but the chocolates have my heart thank you for sharing them says my two and a half year old schnauzer doesn't do well in cars He's fine until the car begins moving, and then he whines loudly, nonstop, until the car stops again. He does likewise in our elevator. He has no hesitation entering the elevator and stands quietly until movement begins. All the while, he is whining, and his tail is still wagging. Do you have any recommendations that I can try? So, Sandy, isn't this an interesting question? Yes. Yes, it's very interesting. So um, here's my thought on this, and there's there's lots of venues or angles on this where you're going to get the same answer from me. This is all about desensitizing the dog to the environment. So uh, let's get Sandy here on the screen so you can see her too. <laughs> you all probably recognize Sandy from watching our channel. But um, what you need to do here... Um, you know, Sandy, if I lived in a high-rise building with an elevator, I'd say, hey, Sandy, let's go sit in the elevator for a while. And you and I would go sit and chit-chat. We'd bring a cup of tea. I might even bring some lawn furniture and just sit in the elevator with the dog, letting the dog ride up and down, up and down, up and down. And I would be very calm and relaxed myself, maybe even listening to some nice music. It might also be a great way for you to get to know some more of your neighbors that live in your building. <laughs> and I would desynthesize the dog to the movement of the elevator and the car. And I, I have here, Sandy has here, something I don't use these very often, but in a circumstance like this, you might want to try one of these types of products. So something like quiet moments, calming aids, um, a calm support, this kind of thing could be helpful to try just to give those to your dog before you start doing the desynthesization. But I would do that every day for several days and it could even be a couple weeks until your dog is um, fine about being in the elevator and the movement. It's really a movement issue. So teaching your dog to wobble on a wobble board, teaching your dog to go up and down on box like we do here when we're teaching dogs to do those things. And then in terms of being in the car, you know, Sandy, I made a mistake several years ago, many years ago with a dog of mine. The only place she went was to the vet and the groomers in the car. And before too long, she didn't like the car so much. And that was really what caused me to learn, I've got to make sure I'm getting puppies exposed to cars. And Sandy, you've been so kind. You take many of my puppies out for rides and getting them going somewhere fun so that they don't think that the uh, car is just about the vet or the groomer. Just hearing the windshield wipers and the music or my books playing or um, different uh, sounds outside the window and just just being in a car seat and knowing that it's okay yeah. but I thought something that was really important that you said is your your um, how are you feeling because I feel like dogs kind of pick up on on your on your how you're feeling and so just keep everything calm and this is what we do and I, I think the more you get them used to it the better they are right oh that, that is it. that is absolutely yeah. the case yes <clears throat> so getting um, yourself calm and relaxed before you get in the elevator, getting yourself calm and relaxed and say, hey, I'm gonna spend the next two hours in my car and we're not really going anywhere. I'm gonna be doing my email or I'm going to be doing some sort of work or reading something, listening to something. And by doing that, it will change. Tinkerbell, for example, that little puppy that I mentioned to you that was uh, very afraid of the car, it took a 10 hour car ride going on vacation for her to finally decide, okay, being in the car isn't so bad. But thank you for that question. All right, another question from Plan Her Life 6590. How to get a three-month-old comfortable with clippers? 
She says, I've had her for three weeks and she doesn't mind chewing on the clipper handle when it's on, but she doesn't want the clippers to touch her. So clippers, I would use clippers like this. And by the way, Sandy can tell you when we have little tiny puppies, we've got the clippers in with the little tiny puppies, even when they're three weeks old. So we turn them on and we don't actually clip. We just run the clipper over their body like this. So not actually clipping the dog. So slowly, you know, sit on the sofa, watch your favorite YouTube channel, uh, comb your dog, and then just take the clipper without it being on and just run it over your dog's head, hair, ears, all of that. Feet. Feet, yeah. exactly. And then slowly, this is back to that desensitizing, right? you got to slowly every day... And then finally you just turn it on and you just run this while it's on over the dog's body and stop. And then reward your dog, give him a hug. Good job, yes, honey, be good girl. And do it every day, sometimes multiple times a day. That will desensitize your puppy over time. How about treats? Would you give him treats for, you know? Uh, so, kind of thing? yeah, I'm glad you asked. Okay. I wanna give a dog a treat when the dog is calm and relaxed. You don't wanna give a dog a treat and reward them for anxiety. So it is possible that you could give a dog a treat while they are um, learning about that. All right, this um, Plan Her Life says also how to potty train to go outside. Um, let's see, she says her puppy never used a potty pad and she hasn't learned how to cue us that she needs to go out. Ooh, I have a bunch of videos on my channel that are specifically on this topic where I show you exactly step-by-step step what to do to potty train a puppy. I would encourage you to look one of those up. I'll link some of those below so that you can watch and see how we do that here and then also what we recommend. But I'm gonna tell you bottom line, you need a puppy playpen. If you don't have a playpen and you're just letting your dog run willy-nilly all over your house, you're creating a bigger problem for yourself. When you got Maui, Toffee Maui is Sandy's dog, and when she got him, we made sure you had a playpen, mm -hmm. and he stayed in his playpen, and he never had an accident in the house. He learned right away to just go right outside. That's exactly what he does. Yeah, so yes. that works. Let's see here. A big, huge believers in... Uh, puppy playpens and you'll see again I have videos called how to set up a playpen how to set up a puppy playpen those kinds of things and I talk about potty training in those and why it's so important all right next question here is from Lucky and Lucky says I have two questions how to manage tear and beard stains on a white schnauzer and so we'll start with that one so we've got a couple of products here I see the ice on ice there Two? Mm -hmm. Yep, there we go. I love, 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 love this line of Chris Christensen products. This one's called White on White. They also have one called Black on Black. Um, obviously, this is for white or light colored dogs. This is one of the best shampoos you will find, and it really does the job. I'll point out, though, that when you put it on your dog, it's purple. <laughs> And you're going to say, what did Sean do here recommending this purple shampoo? Well, when you rinse it out, your dog will be white. Now, follow the instructions because it does say if you've got some uh, challenging stains, you may need to leave it on for 10 minutes and maybe even another 10 minutes beyond that if the stains don't come out. But I highly recommend that. And then this Ice on Ice is a detangling conditioner that goes nicely. It's also this line of Chris Christensen. You will find all of our favorite products in the SVCC Toys. So go to our website, svcctoys.com. There's a shop and every product that we're recommending today is in that shop, makes it really easy for you to purchase these. Now, there's another product that is um, Spa Lavish Tears. And so this one can work very well also around the eye area, beard, facial cleanser. So again, part of this question is making sure that you are 
Now, not doing things that tee your dog up to have stains. And so uh, combing food out of the beard or washing the beard after the dog eats. If you're feeding the dog, if I'm feeding my dog blueberries, for example, and I've got a white dog, I need to expect that I need to clean that right away on the beard. If a dog licks its paws, licks its paws, licks something on its body regularly, that spot is going to turn a reddish or a yellowish color. And I would say that's probably an, a yeast issue, an overgrowth of yeast, and that's where you're going to want to use something like Fortiflora. So if you've got a dog that doesn't get enough probiotics, that's going to cause a problem. And I'm a big, huge believer in these two products, NuVet Plus, which is a vitamin pill, and Fortiflora. And I also use probiotics like yogurt, same kinds of yogurts I eat, no sugar in them. And again, these are on the shop, SVCC Toys. So let's see. She also says, or Lucky also says, um, how long does crate and house training typically take? Depends on where you got your dog. Depends on uh, the kind of environment that your puppy was in when your puppy was growing up. So what do I mean by that? Well, here... Our puppies are on and use potty pads. So if you get a puppy from us, you can expect that your puppy is going to go on a potty pad. And if you keep that potty pad by your door that you want the dog to go out of to go potty, you just watch when your dog is going to the potty pad and take it right on outside. But how long does it take to crate train a dog? Well, again, if you've gotten a dog are getting a dog from us, they're used to going in and out of crates. They're not necessarily used to the door being closed, but my advice is put the crate on the bed and let the dog sleep next to you at night in the crate if you want, and they'll get used to being in a crate really quickly. Uh, how long does it take to crate and house train a dog? Well, again, it's going to depend on the environment that they're coming from when they come to you. If a dog, if a puppy was raised on grates, metal grates, it's gonna take you a really long time because that dog has been taught to pee and defecate and then it falls through the grate and they have no relationship with their urine and their feces. And so they don't really understand it. So I do my best to make sure I'm never getting a dog that's been in that kind of environment um, so really ask diligent questions to ensure that you understand uh, what was the surface that your dog got used to going potty on before you got it. If it's a concrete slab, that puppy's going to be looking for a concrete slab to go on. Now, sometimes I have to say to people, my dogs are used to going potty on a potty pad. And they're not going to know the difference between that and your white towel on the floor in your bathroom. <laughs> you do have to pick it up because... <laughs> Now he has picked that. I do have my potty pad in the bathroom, mm -hmm. and uh, and I have a white mat, so I have to pick that up, and he doesn't go on there. But just going along with this question, I have to tell you something funny that Maui does because he is so potty trained. He'll he sleeps with us, and in the middle of the night, if he has to go, he can normally hold it, but he'll get up and he runs into the bathroom and does his thing, and then comes back to bed. <laughs> so you don't even need to get up. So I really think that the potty pad training is awesome. I think it's incredible. It is so great. Kim, I think you agree, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, do you wanna do you wanna speak for a moment about uh, your experience? Yeah. So Kim has three of our dogs, and sometimes she has five of our dogs <laughs> at her home. And you also use the potty pads. Yes, we do. Love the potty pads. I will say, at first, I think we talked about this, it was a little bit confusing because they didn't know the difference between the potty pad and the carpet because we had carpet in our house where you don't have carpet in the space where you have them. But they were, they're so smart, so smart. And so they're very easily trained. They know the potty pad from the car carpet is very light colored, looks just like a potty pad. So now they've got it, they've got it down though. Yep, but it, it does take a little bit in that transition. And that's something that I think is so important to point out is sometimes people will say to me, hey, the dog is potty trained in your house. And I say, yeah, but it's not potty trained yet in your house. 
So even though it knows to go on a potty pad at my house, you're going to still have to reinforce that. You're going to have to still make sure that the dog uh, understands where you want it to go when you get it to your house. So those verbal rewards like, yes, potty, yes, yes good job, woohoo, and then perhaps a little treat or something to signal that uh, this is what I want you to keep doing. Now this feeds in nicely to a question from Organic Gal. Hi, Organic Gal. She says, how difficult is it to train an older dog that has never used a potty pad to start using one for emergencies? I happen to know you're asking me about a boy and uh, he is not one of my dogs, but uh, she had him before. Organic Gal now is going to be owning three of our dogs. Yeah. Will you hand me the, the, the teal box there with the potty pads? Great, thank you, Kim. So, Organic Gal, when you come this week, I'm gonna give you some of these. Pop-up pee pads. Oh my goodness, these are so great for both male and females, actually. Let me show you what they look like. So Kim, maybe you and I will be uh, demoing this together. There we go. Oh, wow. So this <laughs> little fire hydrant oh, here, yeah, isn't that great? That is scented. While you and I don't smell it necessarily, dogs do, and they get very excited immediately to go potty here. And so this is another great tool to have on hand to train um, puppies and dogs to go where you want them to go. Sometimes when people get puppies from me and they want them to start going outside, I say, let's take a potty pad outside, put it under the tree or the bush or wherever you want your dog to go outside, put this on it. And then as soon as they start going, yes, yes, potty, woohoo! You do a little potty party and uh, we're so happy that the puppy is going potty in the right spot. It sometimes takes a little while. I'm thinking of Walter. Nancy's mom, or no, Nancy is Walter's mom. <laughs> um, I, it, Walter was very good at going potty on the potty pad. He'd go outside and then he'd come back inside and go potty on the potty pad. And she said, why is he doing this? Well, because that's where he learned. That's mm -hmm. how he learned to go potty. And so what we had to do with him was take the potty pad outside, get him used to going potty outside, mm -hmm. reward that behavior. So, yeah. Makes sense. That's right. All right, and Organic Gal, we can't wait to see you. No, you're gonna see you soon. Organic Gal is getting her third schnauzer from us. More about that. All right, next up, MTM1544 writes, I've always read that a timid, anxious dog should not be bred so that the puppies won't inherit that trait. Even with extra training, the dog would still carry that trait. Is this right? What do you think? No. <laughs> Sandy and Kim, what do you think? I was just gonna say that seems like, like that can't, that isn't true. Yeah, that's not true. And in fact, we can prove that's not true. How can we prove that's not true? Uh, well, we've got a couple dogs here that we got from other breeders who had not been trained at all before they came here. Dazzle, Dazzle had, is a good example of that, right? Dazzle is a perfect example of that. You want to pick her up for a second here? Our little Miss Dazzle arrived here with no training at all. And, you know, our corporate uniform here is black. Can you tell? It's true. And when we're holding a black dog, you can't see her. I say our corporate uniform here is black, and we all laugh about that because it doesn't take too long for you to start to realize, oh, you know, it's probably better to wear black when we're here because we are picking up puppies, we're picking up dogs, whatever. But with our little black dogs, we got to hold them apart from us so that we can see them. But um, Dazzle had no training whatsoever when she arrived. And now she is a very calm, relaxed, happy dog, and she will not pass along her timidity, her passiveness to her puppies. I would say to you that how puppies are raised from the time that they are born until they go to their new homes makes a huge difference in their temperament, but so does what happens to them at your house. So it's, it's really all about the training that they get and uh, you'll be able to watch if those of you who are watching along with what we're doing with Mocha, for example, Mocha is very, very calm, relaxed. Some would say passive, timid, 
um, very shy, super shy. He burrows his head into your shoulder. He, he puts his head around your, your neck. Um, he doesn't want to be out there yet, but I promise you in a month, two months, that dog will look very, very different and he will not pass that trait to his offspring. But what I can also say about all of our little schnauzers is that every one of them that we've produced here is calm, relaxed, willing to be a therapy dog. Now, Kim says, wait a minute, have you remembered Godiva? <laughs> and I would say, yes, I do remember Godiva. Godiva and Nestle are two of uh, Kim's girls. And uh, Godiva is one of those who, again, with the right training, with the right environment, you know, all is well. But she is, she does come by her name honestly, doesn't she? <laughs> she has a lot of energy and she is very much so a diva. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. Oh, uh, you have a fun story that you tell about being at the vet. Uh, so when the first time I took Godiva to the vet, we were waiting and the person came out and said, Go Diva, Go Diva. And I thought, that's a strange name. Who would who name their name animal their Go, dog, Diva? Go Diva? And then I thought, oh wait, that's our dog. <laughs> it's Godiva. <laughs> yes. But they knew, they knew she was a diva. <laughs> So the three of us obviously all take our dogs to Quakertown Vet Hospital. And when you're waiting in the waiting room there, uh, someone will come out and say the dog's name, right? And that's what Kim is referring to. Go Diva! You're thinking, wow, that's an odd name. Oh, Godiva! Yes, yes. All right, well, she's a diva. So here's a question from Sarah. Uh, my dog is afraid of cardboard boxes. Nothing else, just cardboard boxes. What can we do about that? Oh, let's go back to something we talked about earlier, desensitization. I have a bunch of cardboard boxes in my garage. When Sarah asked this question, I thought, hey, let me get the cardboard boxes for you out of my garage and share them with you because we need to desensitize your dog to cardboard boxes. Now, I would say that most likely something really tricky, traumatic happened for your puppy with a cardboard box, maybe at the breeder, maybe before it came to you, maybe with a UPS delivery person. But um, now what you need to do is put some cardboard boxes in your spaces. So I asked Sarah, where does your dog sleep? And she said, in my bed. I said, great, mine all sleep in my bed too. So put a couple of cardboard boxes in bed with you. Just a few small cardboard boxes on your bed initially. Um, put them next to the, the dog food bowl or um, near the door to go out. Any of those kinds of things would be helpful. And next question here is from Kyle. My dog is afraid of his water bowl. What can I do about that? So my first question is, does your dog have a collar on? Sometimes a collar will hit the water bowl or the food bowl and cause the dog to be uncomfortable with the bowl. So if that's happening, take that collar off. Also, sometimes people will put sort of dangling things on collars. Ooh, I'm not a big fan of that. My dogs don't wear collars around my house. Um, so I would take the collar off if that's happening. And then the other thing I would look at is, is the water bowl or the food bowl, the thing that your dog is afraid of, a reflective surface? Does it reflect back the image of a dog? That's probably the other option if it's not the collar. Kim, will you hand me that little green collar there that's in front of the new Vet Plus? Now, Contrary to what I just said, sometimes we will put puppies, particularly if they're going with a flight nanny, uh, a little collar with a bell on. Why do we do that? Well, at the airport, I want the dog, if it's coming out of its flight carrier, to have this on in case for some reason the puppy gets under a seat or something, we can hear it and know where it is. If you need to be able to hear where your dog is, if you're a first time puppy owner and you're getting a little tiny puppy, put a bell collar on your dog when it is walking around so that you know where it is. Then take the collar off when you are feeding your dog or when you're wanting your dog to sleep and rest, relax. Okay, huh, we're getting, we're getting there. 
Next up is Olivia. Olivia asked me lots of questions and Olivia is considering getting a dog from me. So she has a long list of questions. It's likely uh, that she and I are going to have several phone conversations following this also, just to make sure that we get the level of question uh, answered that she's looking for. So Olivia has asked me, what is the typical weight size difference between a toy and a miniature schnauzer? I have a couple of videos on my channel that outline exactly what are the differences between toy size and miniature sized schnauzers. And I also have this on my website, svcctoys.com, but I'm going to answer it really quickly here. It has to do with weight. So there are several different AKC classifications, standards for schnauzers. One is the giant schnauzer. Next is the standard schnauzer. Next is the miniature schnauzer. Those three have AKC standards that relate to height. The difference between a miniature and a uh, toy has to do with height and weight. So in order to meet the standard for a miniature schnauzer, the schnauzer needs to be 12 inches or taller at the withers, in other words, the shoulders. And so what do we call a dog that is below the standard size for a schnauzer? I've been referring to it as a toy. I've asked in several videos, if you've got a better idea about what to call it, let me know. So toy schnauzers tend to be under 12 pounds and miniature schnauzers tend to be 12 pounds and up. Now, again, some breeders are going to classify things a little differently. There's not a uniform answer to this question. And so it is really important that when you're talking to different breeders, you ask them what their distinctions are and what their the parents' weights were. However, even then, that's no guarantee of what the puppy weights are going to be. I will tell you that I have had my smallest schnauzer that I've ever produced and my largest schnauzer that I've ever produced in the exact same litter. Now, this is the reason that you will hear schnauzer breeders say, I can't guarantee you what weight your puppy will be when it is full grown. That has more to do with factors outside my control than I'm able to navigate. All right, next question. If um, taking a puppy home between eight and 12 weeks, how many hours per day of training do you suggest? I don't suggest hours of training. I suggest that you do five minutes at a time, maybe three or four times a day but definitely never hours of training. Your dog would need to be very advanced in training, uh, years of training to get to the point where I would think in terms of hour long training sessions. Now with that said, you might play fetch with your dog, but that's a game, that's not a training session. So you might play fetch with your dog for a while to help your dog get some exercise. But the things that we do on the places bed and in our agility run, that's going to be five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes max per dog. And again, multiple times a day, you could do that before you go to work. You could do it during your lunch break. You could uh, do it once or twice in the evening. All right, next question she asks, what's the benefit of using a training bed versus the floor? So when we're teaching little puppies and we want them to learn the basics, we use a Kularu training bed and we call it places. Places everyone. So I can say places everyone and my dogs will all get on the little training bed. And uh, this teaches some boundaries. It helps the puppy to learn when they're getting on the places bed, it's time to work now. And so somewhere about three or four weeks into training, we'll teach the puppy to come off of the places bed and start to work on the floor. We prefer to use a places bed because of the age that we're starting with our puppies. Next, Olivia asks, tips for apartment potty training, cage training. And uh, if you're getting a puppy from me, it's already going to be potty pad trained, so you can Put a potty pad in your own bathroom next to your toilet and your puppy will know 
to go there. And you could even use your bathroom as your playpen. So I have mentioned already that I highly recommend a playpen. And what I really mean by that is a constrained area where your puppy is to go potty, to eat, to have toys, a little bit of a play area, but not full run of your apartment. And she asks uh, anything about elevator, can't run outside easily. Um, if you're going to be taking your dog outside, you want your dog to be at least 16 weeks old. You want your dog to have already had all of its DHPP shots. So your dog therefore would need to be at least 16 weeks or older before you start putting it on the ground outside. That's true for anybody, regardless of whether you're in New York or somewhere very rural. Please make sure that um, your dog is fully vaccinated before you start taking it out and putting it on the ground in public places. But you can take your dog out for socializing activities. So you could take your dog out in a carrier, a stroller. I have these, though my favorite products, on my uh, shop, SVCC Toys shop you'll find my favorite stroller there highly recommend that i have carriers and such there too that you can see as well as in many of our training videos i show you when we're socializing puppies how we keep them in the stroller and we allow other people to come and say hello to them but we don't get them out of the stroller until after they've had all of their shots Next up, she says, therapy dog versus emotional support certification. Do you provide these? No, go to a testing site for the therapy dog certification through the organization that is offering the therapy dog certification program. So um, ATD would be an example of one of those American therapy dog, Association of Therapy Dogs, um, Therapy Dogs International. Uh, they have a testing protocol, and I have videos where I show you on my channel exactly what the criteria is, and I also show you some of my dogs passing those tests. So the one that we typically use has three rounds of tests, so you have to go three different times. You're in public places. You have to demonstrate that your dog knows all the basic obedience and that you can be out of sight, out of the room for up to three minutes, five minutes, something like that. Uh, and your dog doesn't get anxious. So those are all important parts of being a therapy dog. But the emotional support certification, this is one that uh, I have not done that myself. And I will tell you that I'm a little leery of these programs where you just call some doctor who lives in, I don't know, some other state somewhere, and they write you a script that your dog is now allowed to be, or your peacock. I've even heard that somebody was able to get their, get a, a script for a peacock to be able to be carried as an emotional support animal. That's a little pushing it for me. I don't, um, I don't do that and I don't agree with that. So again, if you have a trained therapy dog and you want to get that um, emotional support certification for that dog, that makes plenty of sense then because you can take that dog everywhere. But I want a dog that can go to the dentist and the hair salon and the post office, wherever, with me without a problem and know that it's going to be fine. I don't have to carry it in a bag or a pouch or a backpack or something and call it an emotional support. Okay, I've sort of gotten off on a tangent, haven't I? I'll pull myself back. Her next question, puppy diet through eight weeks at SVCC. Oh my goodness, I show you in our videos exactly what we're feeding our puppies. I show you that at three weeks, we start giving them puppy mush and I even show you how to make it. I show you me making breakfast for my dogs. So watch some of my videos and some of our puppy videos and you'll see that. And if you're getting a puppy from us, you'll be able to watch that puppy's development from birth all the way through until it comes to your home. And we will also talk about transitioning foods. So if you're wanting to feed your dog something differently than we do, we'll talk about how to make that transition. But basically you would be integrating the food that I've been feeding into the food that you want to be feeding. And I'm happy to send people home with a little baggie, a little um, something of food so that they can integrate if they're training. But this is the kind of thing where just talk to me about it and we'll figure out the right strategy at the time. All right, next question here. Typical health issues for schnauzers. 
and what have you seen most commonly in your dogs? Well, thank you for asking this one. My dogs are DNA clear for all known issues in dogs, according to the Embark DNA testing. So all of our breeding dogs get Embark DNA tested, and that enables us to offer a 10-year genetic health guarantee on our puppies. So I haven't encountered any genetic health issues with our dogs. So I'll take that question a little more broadly though and say the challenges that people bump into, if a puppy didn't jump up onto something, please don't let it jump off of something. What do I mean by that? If you picked the puppy up and put it on the sofa, then you need to hold on to the puppy until it's able to jump off, or if it didn't jump up, then don't let it jump off. Um, so again, uh, common health issues, uh, broken leg, toe, anything like that from jumping off of a surface that the dog didn't jump up onto. So I know someone who allowed the teenagers to hang out with the dog, the puppy, for a while, and somehow the puppy got up onto the back of a chair back here. I obviously was not there, this was not my dog, but the puppy got up on the back of a chair and fell off, jumped off something, who knows, and broke a leg. You know, that's, that's not a good thing. That's the most common uh, issue that I have bumped into with health concerns. Is tail cropping and dew claw removal necessary? No, it's not necessary. You do not have to do it. And uh, you can look at, in essence, the pros and cons of dew claw removal. I happen to appreciate dew claw removal as a puppy because when the dog is being groomed later on, there is less likelihood that a clipper running over the dog will um, hurt the dew claws. So that's a big reason why you do that. If a dog is out playing, running, digging something, and they have their dew claws and it gets yanked off, as an adult, that becomes major surgery. That becomes a major problem. But when they're two days old and you have the dew claws removed, not a problem as I understand it. If somebody has different information than that, please feel free to share it with me. I am always willing to hear other perspectives and other points of view. Love your comments, love your insights, so thank you for that. And uh, tail is purely a preference thing. Here in the United States, people typically want the tail docked on a schnauzer, but if for some reason you're getting a puppy from me and you want a long tail, that's just fine with me. The key to that though is you've gotta let me know in advance because I typically have tails docked at two days old. And so the decision about which puppy is your puppy has to be made before, because I don't typically have people wanting a schnauzer with a long tail. I've only had one or two other people ask me about that, uh, indicating that they would like to have a long tailed dog and the one that I'm thinking of at the moment has a short-tailed dog because she fell in love with one that had already had its tail docked. Is it painful for puppies? Um, I don't think so because the puppies sleep beautifully immediately following the procedure. Uh, my vet does do a little bit of localized anesthesia in the tail. My vet does a fabulous job of taking the skin and um, in essence, putting it over the top of the tail and then putting a stitch in to hold it. So it has a nice looking tail as opposed to just an ugly stub. And for that reason, they do put just a little bit of local anesthesia into the tail when it is docked. All right, again, I'm, I'm not so attached to that that I can't do something different if that's what you want done. Uh, when do I need to go to the vet visit after taking the puppy home? Depends on how old the puppy is when you get the puppy. You are welcome to take the puppy from my house to your vet if you would like to, to get a vet um, certificate of health the minute that you get the puppy. We have had the puppy at our vet regularly and it has gotten a Pennsylvania State certificate of health 
and we have a schedule that we do. So you're asking here about what are the different shots. Let me give that to you. So typically we have the first DHPP shot done somewhere around six weeks, and then it is three weeks after that until the puppy is 16 weeks old. So six weeks, nine weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 weeks for DHPP shots. Now we also do something here, uh, occasionally monoclonal antibodies, and we do those around day 30, 30, 32, 33, somewhere in there, and you might say, all right, what's that and why? Well, monoclonal antibodies build a resistance to parvo. Parvo is the scariest thing that puppies can get. So you ideally want a puppy to be 12 weeks or older so that you don't have to worry about parvo. But the other insurance policy, if you will, against parvo is to do monoclonal antibodies. You can do those at any age, but somewhere around day 33 is fantastic. And that will help to make sure that your puppy or puppies don't get parvo. And then I typically do rabies around six months. Depends on what the laws in your state say. My veterinarian has to follow the laws and I listen to my veterinarian, happily listen to my veterinarian. I can't do what I do without them. So uh, again, you're gonna need to go with what's appropriate in your state because those uh, laws are somewhat different state by state about when the rabies vaccine needs to be done. And our deworming schedule, you didn't ask me about this one, but I have a feeling you're going to ask me about it. So let me just go ahead and answer it here. We start with pyrantal every two weeks, starting at two weeks. Our mom dogs do not test positive for worms, but when mm, puppies are stressed, uh, worms can be dormant in a body and move so we just like to make sure we've done everything we can to ensure that your puppy does not have worms when you get your puppy. We start with Panacure, which is Finbendazole. So the active ingredient is Finbendazole. And we start at six weeks and we give that for three consecutive days and ideally every two weeks until the puppy goes home. You will find videos about this product, Safeguard Dewormer, on my videos. I recommend that you watch it, but this is one of the ones that we use. So we'll either use Panacure, which is a prescription from the veterinarian, or we'll use Safeguard. And you can find the Safeguard in my shop, SVCC Toys Shop. You will find it there. And the dosing instructions are also there. You will need a syringe. So this is what you'll need, a syringe and the safeguard. And based on your puppy's weight, when your puppy leaves here, I will give you the specific dosage for your puppy so that you know how much to dose your puppy for the first three days. I will have most likely done that right before your puppy leaves myself so that you don't have to worry about it. But about two weeks later, if you're noticing any mushy poop, I recommend that you immediately follow up, take action, and deworm your dog with Panicure or Safeguard. You can have your vet do a worm check. However, what we have learned is that those tests aren't always accurate, meaning you can get a false positive if your dog is not having mushy poop, you probably don't have a problem. Olivia's next question is, are puppies required to be spayed or neutered by a certain age? So the question here, required, is an interesting one. I'm not requiring anyone to spay or neuter a dog by a certain age. However, uh, if you are buying a puppy from me, we have to have a conversation about, are you intending to breed this dog? Are you buying a dog that's only going to be a pet? Or are you intending to have a dog that will be bred? And there is a difference in both price as well as expectations around that. So I do have contracts. I have agreements that uh, we would engage in. And if you're buying a puppy that is 
going to be a pet and not bred, then you probably will want to have it neutered or spayed. And we can talk specifically about the pros and cons of that. I do have other videos where I focus on some of the details about neutering and spaying. And I even have a video where I show you one of my dogs as she's going to be spayed and then what we did to prepare her for being spayed as well as uh, what we did to take care of her when she came home. So you can see all of that video. And then I have um, videos of boys who've been neutered and again, what to expect, what to do to take care of them when that's happening. I would typically say you want your girl to go through her first heat cycle so one heat cycle before you spay, and you want your boy, you want his hormones to have come into play. So somewhere between seven and nine months, you could neuter a boy. All right, on to some other fun information, which you might be as excited as we are here. But uh, in the first week of April, Godiva, our little chocolate and tan girl, is going to be having puppies. We bred her to Maui, and so that first weekend in April is when they are due. And then April 19th, Sweet Tea and Maui are due to have puppies somewhere in that few-day range around April 19th. And Penny and Truffles are due to have puppies in that range of probably April 20th to April 27th. So you may recall, those of you who've been around for a while with us, you may remember that last summer, Sweet Tea and Penny had their puppies at the exact same time, and they co-parented. It was really sweet. The reason they co-parented was because Sweet Tea had more puppies than we've ever had in the litter. She had eight puppies in her litter. Penny had three puppies. And so we were able to have them co-parent and they did so beautifully. Our goal of course would be if Sweet Tea has a normal size litter, three puppies, four puppies, then we would not have them co-parent. But if for some reason we need to do that, it is nice that uh, they would be having their puppies around the same time. I also mentioned that Dazzle has just come in season and I'm intending to breed her to truffles. So they would be able to make beautiful solid colored black or that liver and tan, liver and red color puppies. They will be able to produce that. So fingers crossed, um, we'll send good energy that uh, they are interested in doing what needs to be done for them to have puppies. And those puppies would be arriving sometime in May. We also have a new SVCC Schnauzers newsletter. It's an email newsletter. And so if you would like to get that, go to the contact page on our website and just send me a little note saying, please add me to the newsletter, the email newsletter list, and we'll happily send it to you when we do updates in email. Barbara sent me a very sweet note saying congratulations on the 5,000 YouTube followers. Woohoo! We're so happy about that and we're just so grateful again to all of you. But Barbara says this is such a great accomplishment and she says to me thank you for setting the bar so high on breeding schnauzers and I just I really appreciate that and all of the support and love and uh, just everything. It has meant the world to me. Your kind comments, your questions, you're helping me learn and grow. I love learning with you. I love that we share. This community here means the world to me. And you can see that I've literally built, we've commit, we have built a community where there are people who we co-own dogs with and uh, we've built communities around our dogs. So sometimes someone will say to me, I really want a dog and I would like three or four other people to be a part of that dog's life. And we th we think that out. So I've, I've had people call me and say, hey, I'm in my 70s or I'm in my 80s and I would really like to have a dog. And I say, think about who lives near you that would also like to have a dog, but who might not be able to either afford a dog or have the time for a dog right now where you could co-own that dog. And we've created little community opportunities like that around many of our dogs. And we just love doing that because our mission is to expand love and joy in the world with our dogs. 
And so when human beings, when people come together and uh, support and love and nurture a dog, we are growing love in the world. And I just want to thank you all so much for being a part of this community and uh, being in it with me, being on the adventure and the journey. Thank you. Please give this video a thumbs up. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. We'd be so delighted to have you join us in our future adventures. More to come, I promise.